o'clock and we're going to start the subcommittee meeting subcommittee meeting on house bill 655 <clears throat> so as a result of the hearing that we had this week it seemed that there was a concern for the disciplinary portion of the bill is there anyone here um, that would like to speak about something other than that yes would you like to come to the microphone and speak Um, good morning. I'm Elizabeth Ropp. I'm a practicing licensed acupuncturist in Manchester, New Hampshire. And um, as I was reading through the bill, um, I answered my own questions from the other day. But um, I noticed that a number of boards, um, it says that they'll receive a license, board is crossed out, and it's replaced with office. But that's not the case with the licensed acupuncturists. And I was hoping that we could just keep things consistent if the naturopaths and the mental health professionals and the pharmacy interns are going to get their applications reviewed by the office, then just put the acupuncturers licenses applications under that also. Just keep it consistent. That's that, that makes sense to me. Does anybody have any comments on that? No. Okay. okay. We'll put that in the amendment. Representative Pearson sent us written testimony, but if you'd like to speak for a few minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Mark Pearson, among other things, I chair DHHS Oversight Committee. Um, and that's kind of the relevance of why I'm here. After the Boston Globe's spotlight team uh, did a lengthy, lengthy series of articles about a surgeon practicing in New Hampshire. Uh, it mentioned that there were 20 malpractice settlements against that surgeon posted on the Board of Medicine site in Massachusetts with zero on the Board of Medicine site in New Hampshire. So I immediately cranked up a subcommittee of uh, oversight to start looking into this, bringing together stakeholders uh, from the Board of Medicine, the Medical Society, hospitals, nurses, and the various groups, OPLC. And with that in mind, there's a few things I wish to comment on in House Bill 655. First of all, on page 5, lines 10 to 14, it gives to OPLC uh, some non-lapsing funds which will give them the opportunity to move immediately. My subcommittee uh, of oversight did not find fault with the individual from the Board of Medicine who was doing investigations. What we did find is this was a retired individual working without compensation very much part-time. The problem was not this gentleman. The problem is there were not enough of them. And if OPLC at that point had monies that they could use, that could have been rectified almost immediately. Absent that, we are still not doing the kind of work we felt, the subcommittees felt, um, everybody wanted to be done. So that's point number one. Uh, point number two is it mentions in the bill that um, the executive director of OPLC will be working up various protocols that Board of Medicine will follow in the various investigations. This too is something our subcommittee worked on and in recent um, conversation with Lindsay Courtney, um, I believe she welcomes the subcommittee's continued work. In other words, let us work with her. Everyone seems to be happy. We've got this, the group together, and together we can go forward to make recommendations to her for the board. And then my final point um, is page 19. Uh, and go down around verse, uh, yeah, verse, uh, line 22, um, and following and onto the next page. It speaks of requirements for dentists using anesthesia. I read this over recently. I was at the Delta Dental event and had opportunity to speak with a number of dentists. And 
it does not seem that what is in here is necessarily wrong. My question is, should it be in here? And why I say that is, formerly I chaired the Health and Human Services Committee of the House. And whenever we had a bill that told doctors how to practice medicine, we routinely, unanimously ITL'd it because that is not the job of the legislature is to put it into law. First of all, let the Board of Medicine and the medical societies come up with those protocols. If there's egregious mistakes, we can deal with that, but let the professionals come up with it. Secondly, whenever there seems to be a change in the law, it is because there are new best practices. Well, what happens if two years from now there's new best practices again? Well, we're stuck with this law saying what best practices are. So rather than going through the whole lengthy procedure of a bill to change the best practices, uh, it seemed to my former committee that the medical boards, medical societies, could make those changes in protocols. In other words, this may well be good stuff here in the bill. It just doesn't belong in the bill. Regulation of medical groups, dental groups, should not be in legislation to say exactly who should be in the room at what point. That should be the job of the societies of professionals. So with that, that's my uh, testimony this morning, and thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? I and mean, this is sort of an informal meeting, so anybody can pop their hand up if they have a question. No? Okay, thank you so thank much, you Representative much. Pearson. Representative Infantine. Thank you. Other than the disciplinary action, I have two questions. On page 12, line 10, it talks about that the, um, the boards can enjoin someone from doing something. An injunction without bond is available to any board. Page, I'm so sorry. Can you, it was page? Page 12. Page 12, line? 10. Thank you. Oh, yes, I see. So um, I have a lot of uh, experience with injunction bonds, and I just didn't, uh, I'm curious, um, I consider this the executive branch, the OPLC. Does the executive branch override the judicial branch's requirement to have injunction bond relief? So what happens is if I enjoin you and I tell you to stop doing something, the court will say, well, what happens, if, Will, if you're wrong in requesting this inju uh, injunction against you? And, um, and it's going to, I tell you, you can't sell your widget because it has a logo that I think is mine. So I enjoin you for two months from selling your widget. And if I'm wrong, you've lost two months of revenue. I have to post a bond equal to what we think that or what the judge determines that revenue is going to be. And I end up having, to, if I lose, I end up having caused you harm and I have to either pay that amount or the bond will pay the amount. So I'm confused as to how a, a junction without bond is available to, to the board. I think um, Representative I Courtney has an answer for that. So she could. Yeah. And do, um, well, uh, do you, you want to talk about, okay, you can point to both and, of them at the same time, the other one. And I, the, other, the other point I'd like to make is line 20 through line, I don't know, 36. This has to do with the oversight committee. Um, I sit uh, as a, as a, Chairman of the Labor Committee, I sit on the Employment Securities Advisory Board. We meet quarterly and we go over everything that's going on with employment securities, uh, unemployment here in the state. And it is made up of two members of labor, a uh, member of business, uh, one senator, one representative, um, and a few members of the, uh, one member of the public and uh, a member of the uh, Employment Securities Advisory or Employment Securities uh, staff. Having three members of the House and two members of the Senate, I don't think would be as effective as if you had uh, possibly one member from the OPLC and possibly two members, whether it, you know, from one of the, each of, of two boards. Um, I think it gives you a better idea of what's going on. Um, and you can hear from all different sides. It seems to be effective employment securities advisory board. And First of all, trying to find two members of the Senate, good luck. Um, so those are my comments. Representative, I mean, Ms. Courtney, can you answer Representative McDonough's question? And we'll make a note on the other. 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, <coughs> sorry. For the record, Lindsay Courtney, Executive Director of PLC. With respect to the bond, that language is consistent with language that exists in other practice acts. Practically, that, that is also how it works when the state seeks to enjoin um, behavior. I can tell you from my personal experience representing DHHS at the Department of Justice, we regularly were able to seek and obtain injunctions without a bond. Practically, I think the, the reason for that is, one, the state has immunity that private parties don't have um, with respect to um, loss recoveries. And, and secondly, um, it, requirement to put up a bond obviously has an impact on funds, state funds. And um, so I think that those are really the two policy bases uh, for why um, state entities are not required to put up a bond. I don't, I'm not taking a position either way on whether that should be the case, but I did just want to let you know that that's pretty consistent with how it currently operates. Okay. Mix. Is there anyone else that wants to speak about something other than disciplinary action? Okay. So then it's all about disciplinary action right now. Um, does someone want to start the conversation on that? Representative? Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. My name is John DeJoy, and I'm here today representing the National Association of Social Workers, the New Hampshire chapter, as well as the New Hampshire Psychological Association. The, uh, the National Association of Social Workers is requesting one addition uh, that is consistent with one of the psychologists' addition as well, and that is in regard to the subject matter experts relative to the investigations. Uh, we, my client believes that Subject matter experts should always be of a comparable licensure level and uh, practice background of the person that they're investigating. Uh, we don't see that in the statute and would request that that be added in rulemaking. That is also a concern of the psychologists, but the psychologists have a few other concerns that I'd like to outline. Relative to the some of the terms of allegations and complaint, uh, they are different from the terms that folks are using today or that folks are comfortable with. And the practical implication of that is when psychologists recertify or relicense, they have to acknowledge if they have any current um, disciplinary action or and it's often called um, complaints or investigations. So our request would be that regarding the terms of allegations, complaint, and investigation, that they be added to a definition section. So we're all understanding specifically what each term means going forward. So you're asking for a definition of allegation complaints? And investigations, and, just so, okay. so that they can determine for licensure and insurance purposes what exactly is meant. Representative Dolan has a question. Sorry. Um, if that we were to adopt that suggestion, do you have uh, drafted language? Is it, I, do you I, have drafted language that we could put in? I, I do not. I could probably muddle something together, but I believe Director Courtney probably has more specific uh, language that she could share. I haven't I've talked to her. I haven't talked to her about this issue, but I would imagine she has language she could share. Relative to privacy, and, and my clients testified regarding this the other day, there are concerns around privacy of records. Uh, in, the current, in the current RSA, there are clear protections of re-release of, of client records that are um, retained as the result of an investigation. It, it is unclear whether the language is in the current bill, and if it is, we've missed it. And so let me give you a practical explanation of what our concern is. I mean, 91A is covered very well. The, the records are maintained relative to 91A. But as part of investigation, if I'm a psychologist and records are received regarding my patients, the way the bill reads, it is not clear whether OPLC could re-release those records to another party. 
It is our belief that any time client records are used as part of an investigation, they should never be re-released to a third party without proper court order to do so. So we would just like clarification that the records that are maintained as part of the investigation are not available for, for re-release. Um, and the final request is that the Board of Mental Health and the Board of Psychology currently have a different disciplinary procedure than many of the other boards. I'm sorry, do they have similar procedures and those two procedures? Are, okay. Those two procedures are different. The social workers are quite comfortable moving forward with the, um, the procedures as outlined in the bill before us. The psychologists are requesting to maintain their existing disciplinary procedure. Now, I can try to give you my best understanding of what that looks like, um, ostensibly, and I think there's other people here who can probably explain it better. Ostensibly, it is a process within the board where there are several psychologists who are investigated, who are investigators. Um, there is a liaison between the board and the OPLC, and investigators are assigned by that liaison from within that pool of, of um, subject matter experts. They provide findings of of their investigation to the board um, in, due, in due course. It's, it's a little bit different because it's a process within the board structure as opposed to um, within OPLC and working with the board. And that's the um, NHPA's request. And I believe that's what I have to cover. Okay, thank you, noted. Okay. Madam Chair, I apologize. Oh. One last thing I forgot. Sure. The last thing that I would mention is in, in the, uh, the fines and, and fees section, there is an uncapped potential for um, reimbursement for investigative costs. My clients believe that that should not be um, an infinite. It should have some cap put to it if it's included. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Greetings. I'm Dr. Deborah Warner. I'm representing uh, myself, uh, my practice, Bright Day Psychology in Littleton, New Hampshire. And I've also well informed about the statutes. Um, I was part of the process developing the psychology and the some other provisions that are in both psychology and board of mental health practice statutes. Um, I presented you with a copy, I'm sorry, I didn't get it over to you, um, of a suggested amendment mm -hmm. to the bill. And it, it does reference uh, that it could be, uh, we could rewrite section 22 of our chapter. Uh, I can give you copies of that as well it's a bit longer but the excuse me can you make sure can do you have extra copies there i have could you please give a copy to um mrs miss courtney behind you from oplc and also give a copy to represent i'll give her my copy if you can give me an extra copy uh so uh I would suggest that for the psychology uh, statute that we um, make some changes in the first section that gives exceptions for override by the chapter um, pertaining to a receipt of an allegation, um, investigation of a complaint, and uh, that's in the first part of my handout. Uh, the next section, section 144, uh, is about criminal records check. Uh, that we would have, if there is, if somebody does not clear their criminal record check, that that should go before the board. In section 145, uh, that the board is the entity issuing the license and not the office. And certainly they would delegate many, many things to the office to do for automated licenses and such. Um, and in, 
in Roman two of that same section, uh, examinations, it was crossed out, written, oral, or both, uh, that it would be retained. Uh, sometimes when the um, candidate, the applicant fails one of the tests, uh, they might go through a rewrite, but the board does give them another chance by coming in to do an oral, and very often they pass. I have a question. So you're, you're speaking only for yourself, correct? I'm speaking only for myself. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, missing from the 329B, section 15, same at the top of the next page, you can see uh, they need to add a Roman three has passed the criteria set forth by the board in its rules. Uh, somehow or other, that's not in there in the law, but it is certainly in the rules for the Board of Psychology. And then we get to section 147 where there's a whole slew of repeals of the psychology uh, sections. And um, you can see on my lots of red in there, um, it, we do not, be, I do not believe, and others I have conferred with, uh, do not, and you have heard Dr. Phillips yes, the other day as well, um, that we should not repeal the rules making of the board concerning license procedures or relative to rules regarding complaint procedures, uh, that those should remain in the board. And they do get help with OPLC. It's usually very collaborative in that way. Um, it's all right to is repeal the establishment of fees. Um, I would not see that it's advantageous to um, repeal the telepass license. That is a very particular license that's not covered under the new licenses offered by this statute, um, the, the changes in this bill. Uh, the telemedicine is an out-of-state entry that is very easy. It's instantly... Um, it, it, Granted, you can do it online it, it, as designed. It's not yet up and running. Uh, but somebody, if they want to follow a patient into the state who's traveling, one of our snowbirds or a, a, a college student, that it could be done very, very easily. And it's an ongoing license. It's not just 120 days. The current easier one is 120 days, and it terminates with a f application for a full license. Many people from other states don't want to go through that process. Um, relative to injunction, that's fine to repeal, in, in my opinion. Um, when it comes to RSB 329B20, relative to temporary and emergency, um, the, the new statutes and as well as this bill uh, do provide for temp licenses, but they do not deal with the special thing that we have in our practice. Um, our, our specialty is forensic psychologists who come in from other states to do examinations and consultations with the courts. Those can last longer than 120 days and they are uh, often done in sporadically throughout a, maybe even a two-year period. And the language that I put in here would pull from the current statute and keep just the forensic temp license in place. Uh, that was created because there was much uh, petition. We don't need the history. We just want your basic okay, comments. Okay, there you go. Um, the... 329B21, relatively disciplinary action. I would omit that repeal. And then you go to section 22, investigations and complaints. I did, I wouldn't repeal it, but I would also rewrite it. I've got a longer version of how I would rewrite it, bringing in the language and the wording that goes with uh, what's been put forth in the OPLC plan. Um, I just must say that I am in favor of getting this all together and having a, a more coordinated fashion. Uh, but these are little things that need to go. And so that's it for my, my uh, recommendations for my uh, amendment. Thank you so much. We'll take those into consideration. There'll um, be another follow-up meeting to this, so. Oh, we are, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I did have a couple of clarifications of some things that were said earlier. Should I go on those? Let's wait on that. Quickly, okay? yes. I'd like to get to the meat of the matter today. Okay. I will just leave it then. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, um, the gentleman with the red tie, whose name I don't know, you can come forward.
Good morning. Good morning. My name is James Bombersbach. I am the legislative chair for the New Hampshire Psychological Association. Uh, just, I wanted to add a comment in addition to Dr. Warner's testimony. Uh, it's my understanding that our psychological association, which represents approximately 200 uh, psychologists in the state, is also in favor of retaining language that would allow oral examinations uh, as part of the licensing examination. Uh, we are aware that the current licensing procedures are extensive and, and could be beneficial to change, and I'm happy to have my organization consult with uh, Ms. Courtney about making changes to those, but the maintaining the oral examinations as part of that is important because it allows for an opportunity for someone to, on a rare basis, not, not I don't think it's used that often, but on a rare basis to uh, allow them to demonstrate their skills in a way that may not be uh, they may be more favorable or, or in their interest. Um, so even just a matter of making sure that someone with a uh, learning disability who has difficulty with that kind of uh, essay test or multiple choice test, allowing them to demonstrate their skills in an alternative way. Uh, again, this, we don't think this happens very often, but it would be important not to prevent it from happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Infantine. Thank you. It was really good for me to sit here for an hour in the first hearing because I got to hear from some of the other boards. And my comments are going to be similar to what I had stated um, last week with a few, uh, excuse me, earlier this week with some caveats. I fully respect the, the, the job that the OPLC is trying to do to organize. There was a lot of things all over the place. Mm -hmm. I still think there are three different groupings. There are construction, there are professional, and there are health-related organizations, boards. And some of them need to be treated differently. And let me explain regarding the hearings, because, because my issues, obviously, like everybody else, are page 20 for the electricians, lines 13 through 21, repealing them, some of these things. While I'm in favor of making some changes that will be good for the boards and the OPLC, I'm not in favor of repealing them whole in one, one lock, sock, barrel. We had a hearing the other day. We had a hearings officer. We had an attorney in the room. It was fantastic. The hearings officer could uh, swear people in. They kept the, the conversation going when someone went a run on question, you know, get to the question, and, and it kept things going well. And I know that with the attorney there, with the hearings officer there, there was a protocol. And if anyone ever complained about what went on, there was a clear delineation of exactly what happened, who did what and when. We, the uh, members of the electrician's board, could also ask questions and of, of, of the, the witness, if you will. And so we could ask questions and we can make decisions. I feel the OPLC wants to make it so we're just the jury. We have to sit quietly. We don't ask questions. And then they have a professional that is going to, in essence, question uh, the, the witness or the person that, that may be in trouble with the board. Um, I don't want it to go that way. Now, that may work. You heard someone state that we don't have an expert. I don't know what that clinical psychology thing person does, so we need an expert to come in. So that would make sense in that case, but not all the boards. I don't think the um, um, funeral directors need another professional funeral director, nor do the electricians need another professional electrician in the room to ask the witness questions so we can then be the jury. That may work in some other, uh, but I don't believe it does for all. Uh, so I'm in favor of the rule changes. I'd like them to be um, the protocol that the OPLC wants to use, but I don't want some of these repeals. Repeal it, re re uh, repealing the fees. Uh, the board should clearly, and, and I, 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 I'll be honest with you, I was going to do it, but I've been up here four times this week. I have not studied 319C, 6, 9, and 12 probably as well as I should. Um, we won't hold it against you. Thank you. Um, but, you know, th there are some things in there about the fees that, that we would like still have some uh, authority to do. Some of the disciplinary action, some of the renewal, some of the, you know, we, we would li still like to be engaged and have a say in some of these things. But we are okay with the OPLC having clear direction and uniformity to many of the things we do. But again, it can't go overboard. We don't need an expert on electric in front of three three master electricians. Um, so I can't give you line by line, Madam Chairman, no. what needs to be done. 
Um, but I would, I would rather, you know, I, I like Mays a lot better than I like Shals in law when it comes to uh, the executive branch. And uh, I hope maybe if you're going to have one more meeting, I can give you line by line what things I'm okay with re repealing in each one of 319 C, 6, 12, and 14, and which ones I don't. But I just hope you understand what the difference between what I feel the OPLC wants to do across the board. Um, that may be okay for some, but not all. And I think it would be a waste of time and money in certain instances. Plus, it makes us really mostly ineffective. Mm -hmm. So I think someone who testified before us made a comment that there's the efficiency and cost effectiveness of doing it one way and justice the other way. So it's a, it's a, it's a situation where we want balance, right? Correct. And so maybe <clears throat> we are going to have another subcommittee meeting on this because this is quite, there's a lot, of, there's a lot to this and I'll take, your recommendation to heart as to the different classifications of of a boards because it seems to be there are some boards that are stronger than others so i'll we'll let you know in the next step committee meeting and, and what you said makes sense to me thank you and i and i understand there needs you know what what the, the oplc and the commissioner wants to do I, I, in, in my heart, I do. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a little bit of a, an old fashioned, you know, guy who wants to move either slower or doesn't want some of my authority taking away and, and, um, where we have to kind of strike that balance. But as a legislator, and as a citizen, I realize we have to have some uniformity. We cannot expose the state to, uh, possible financial, you know, detriment because it's all over the place. Correct. Or the public safety, Correct. right? Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you. I think it's very concise testimony. Thank you. Yes, Representative, Ms. Ms. Courtney. Now she's going to be Representative Courtney. <laughs> Lynn, yeah. Getting upgraded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I can't use that term. Um, take the opportunity, and I have um, our general counsel here to address uh some of the concerns raised because I, I share the same goal, particularly of the ones that articulated by Representative Infantine. I would suggest so what the statute does is it it's it's a little scary because it, it repeals a lot of sections, but it repeals a lot of sections that are similar and puts it somewhere else. Just globally, we have um, if you put all of our um, statutes in one. Uh, one document. Thank you, Doug. Sorry, it's a little, I'm a little tired today. It's over 800 pages long. Labor, which is a similar agency, has less than 25% of that. And our statutes all say pretty much the same thing, but in slightly different ways. So what we'd like to see happen is have one statute regarding procedures and one statute um, regarding licensing, as opposed to having to look at 50 plus different statutes. It's an administrative nightmare. Um, so from a policy standpoint, we are certainly open to having, um, you know, amending the language uh, to be different as to how um, hearings and disciplinary proceedings must be run. But we, we do think it's necessary to uh, basically strip a lot of these similar statutory provisions out of the statute so that we can provide the best support possible. Um, regarding the hearings, the it is referenced in 310. Um, the proposed bill um, provides for a procedure that it's very similar to how it's run now. Um, I didn't see anything in the language that would eliminate a board's ability to ask questions, and we would expect that that would continue to occur because they are the subject matter experts. I think certainly that language could be firmed up to make that clearer, um, and we would welcome that change. But we, we, uh, 
I guess, feel pretty strongly that we'd like to have a little bit more of a concise statute for us to look at because it's very, it's just very challenging for us to administer. Um, and Doug, I'll let you weigh in on the other stuff because I could go on for days and I don't want to, Madam Chair. Representative Shewitt has a question. Thank you. Um, hi, <laughs> Ms. Courtney. Uh, you said that uh, of the repeals, some of the things that still need to be in place are put in other places. Is it possible for you to give us, I don't know, a diagram? <laughs> this yeah. is repealed, but it's put here. Yes, we can certainly do a crosswalk for you and bring it to the next meeting or hopefully in advance of the next meeting, if that would be helpful. Um, because the statute is, I mean, the bill is huge, but there are really only a couple of things that it does, which is sets forth a, a streamlined process for investigations, streamlined process for disciplinary hearings, and streamlined process for licensure. But because we have so many statutes, um, it's going to be big when you repeal that. I think that would be helpful. And could I just ask a follow-up? Um, I, I know you were at the hearing, and uh, I think most of the folks here, their basic message is one size doesn't fit all. So I'm hoping that um, that's reflected in what you're going to show us in the future. Yeah, I guess I would disagree with that when it comes to procedure. Um, when it comes to substance, one size does not fit all. But when it comes to procedure, which is really intended to provide for due process, I don't understand why it would be different across the boards. Uh, procedure, it's pre procedure, it's just how you make a decision. It's not necessarily the decision that you reach. So I would, I would disagree with that. I, I know that, um, you know, several boards believe that they are unique in certain circumstances. I, I don't, but we agree to disagree with respect to procedure. There seems to be two things going on here. One is. You said this is a repeals redundant provisions of the law. In other words, it's a housekeeping. But you're also changing policy. You're changing the procedures and the, the policy that the that the uh, state sets that you're asking us to uh, do. Could you uh, separate those two? So, so that in, a, in some type of a report that would explain exactly what are the housekeeping areas and then where are your policy changes. And also an organizational chart of the current organization and, the, and what it would look like when, if this was passed. And also with that, flow a flow charts or charts that would show us the beginning and the end of every process how it is now and what you're asking us to approve because there's a lot there's this is 76 pages long and there appears to be a lot more in here than just housekeeping and 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 quite and i come out of the out of city government as a city manager, if I pre presented this to a city council, they'd throw it back at me <laughs> because it, it, cause you're supposed to help us to understand this. And there's not a lot of help here. So thank you. Yes. So just to be clear, this is not an OPLC requested bill. This bill is a result of recommendations that were put forth by the committee established by Senate Bill of 330 last year, which we participated in, but we did not request this bill. I'm happy to provide a crosswalk or, or walk you through what the bill would do. With respect to cleanup, I would submit that we already have the authority over procedures for both licensing and for complaints. The problem is we can't have one procedure because every practice act has different statutory language in it. So it is truly cleanup um, in that sense. There's also been some statutory conflicts, which we've seen with fees. We've had fee setting authority since 2015. 
And we have not been able to promulgate rules regarding fees because the board practice acts have retained that. And as those have been amended, they've superseded our statutes. Any type of OPLC legislation is going to be large when it's cleaned up just because of the sheer number of statutory provisions we have. And we certainly have debated, you know, do we do it piecemeal? Do we not do it piecemeal? I think the recommendation out of SB 330 subcommittee, um, which of course was bipartisan in nature, uh, was that this was the way to attack this particular cleanup bill. There are two other bills that were recommended by that subcommittee. One um, was concerns the quorum um, requirements allows boards to meet remotely. We like that idea because I think that would increase participation. And the other has to do with the funding mechanism. So uh, um, to uh, Representative Infantine's point earlier, we do need a better process for involving the boards with with fee setting authority. And that bill is intended to make sure that we are providing them with allocation um, budgets um, and engaging more of a conversation. But when you have two regulatory bodies that have the same authority, it, it doesn't work. And what we've seen is that on that, those issues, government has been in a standstill. Representative Madam Shula. Chair, if I may, um, for the uh, members of the committee who are new, <laughs> the uh, study committee that uh, the director is referring to is available online in our statutory and chaptered study committee section. Look at Senate Bill 330, Laws of 2022, and I will tell you that it's almost as thick as the bill but it's got a complete transcript of those meetings, uh, questions that were asked, and their final report. So I think you might find that helpful in referencing some of the changes that are suggested. And, and Representative, I'm happy to sit down with you at any time and walk you through it or provide you with any sort of documentation that 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 does a crosswalk um, at any time. Wasn't intending to not be helpful, but I wanted to give you the broader picture of the hi history of this bill. Madam Chair, if you don't mind, I think um, we wanted to address another point. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for letting me speak. Douglas Sosterhout, General Counsel of the OPLC. Uh, Director Courtney doesn't like to say my last name. She finds it intimidating. That is true. <laughs> we'll, but we'll get I there. actually do, too. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, um, one of the things we heard a lot about on Wednesday, we had a lot of testimony from psychology. We had a lot of testimony from mental health. After the fact, we had some conversations uh, with Reverend Chewett, with Dr. Warner, um, and it caused me to go back and take a second look at the language, and I think there are some valid points um, as they pertain to psychology and mental health. And yesterday I began, unfortunately I wasn't able to finish. My goal was to have some language to show people today. Um, I'll finish it up as soon as I can and, and distribute it as soon as I can. Um, but we are actually taking a crack at amending the language in this bill to build in some of those extra protections that I do think are there uh, with good reason for psychology and mental health. And, and you know, investigating further, I see some of the concern they have. And what specifically concerns would they would be addressed in your amendment? Uh, some of the concerns would be around uh, who gets eyes on the records, how they're approached, but also above and beyond that, there's a certain level, I think, at psychology and mental health where um, there's a vulnerability in potentially the people affected by a licensee. And so what, what we're also incorporating is uh, a requirement for OPLC investigators to go in and approach the board before we address some of the individuals who may not have been named or may have been named but aren't aware, uh, not the actual complainant themselves, and sort of building in those extra layers of protection and getting the subject matter experts to weigh in at an additional level um, before investigations proceed. And so I'm taking the language. I did a I, I reviewed the language that's currently in law in both 
psychology and mental health practice acts. Um, the language, except for citations, is pretty much verbatim. It's word for word, but I did a, a line by line comparison to make sure of that before I proceeded with amending the bill. Uh, and I'm incorporating a lot of that language into the investigative piece in 655 so that it will show up in 310. Now, I know Dr. Warner this morning proposed an amendment to uh, 329 and uh, I haven't had a chance to review that in detail, but I'll look at, at what she proposed and I'll, and I'll see what I can do with that as well. Um, of course, collaboratively, but I just wanted to make the subcommittee aware that based on testimony, based on conversations, we are making some adjustments to the language right now. Yes, Doug. Thank you. Um, I am sure that you were aware from the hearing the other day also, there were a few representatives of different boards, real estate and so forth, who said that they were unaware that these changes were being suggested. Uh, my large concern is that you have so many boards and commissions under you that people that were unaware of this that we haven't heard from yet may have concerns that aren't being brought forward also. So I can speak to that representative. So as you probably know, this was a confidential bill. So we saw it obviously um, when it was released on the 20th, we do provide weekly updates regarding um, the calendar. Um, we also provided a list of all of the LSRs, asked the boards to go through and identify ones that they were interested in having us track on their behalf. We had preliminarily identified some bills, but we need their guidance as well. Um, and when this bill came out, the next board chair meeting that I have, and I have them on a monthly basis, I verbally told them about it. Um, but again, only five chairs go. So, um, you know, that's part of the issue. But, um, you know, it's always a timing problem with legislative process for boards because it moves so quickly and they only meet once a month. So um, I do feel that we notified them um, as soon as we were able to notify them. And, um, you know, to the extent that boards are able to take a position where, you know, we're working collaboratively with them on that um, is what I would offer. I think that it's it's tough for the boards to to participate because of the nature of their work. Thank you, I appreciate that. and. I also appreciate that this was not an impetus of, of you or, or your department. Um, and I know the bill came out quite late uh, in the process even. So thank you for that insight. Does anyone else wish to speak? Mr. Rancourt, is that you coming towards? Good. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Stephen Rancourt. I'm a licensed electrician in the state of New Hampshire, also the executive director of the Electrical Contractors Business Association. And we spoke on the bill the other day and just had some concerns. Um, just reiterating some of the things that have been brought forward is we understand that uh, Lindsay has a very tough job trying to manage both sides of this and find a happy medium. Uh, we think she's doing her best and we, we try to support her best we can, but we do have some concerns, <clears throat> especially with the privacy part, but Kind of what was just discussed most recently is I think the com communications is the problem. All right. And, and again, I know Lindsay has been out of town, blah, blah, but we talked about, she talked about getting this to the boards. Our board met Tuesday and I brought this to the attention of our board. It wasn't on the agenda. It wasn't there. You know, the board didn't know anything about it. So while she's got a lot going on, we still have to work on that <clears throat> because how does the board not find out about it in a meeting a day before at least if it was confidential which i just found out i didn't realize you know we saw it a little earlier but um so with a lot of these things communication the board doesn't know what's going on we're they're finding out about these things afterwards we hear about this legislation we try to track it we have a lobbyist and trying to keep on top of it is the amount of changes that has happened to the oplc is incredible i mean it's just over the last couple of years for instance, we found out about our licenses are gonna be going to a two-year renewal. We're one of the few that do three-year renewals. 
and I understand why it's going to. It's a biennium budget. It's much easier to figure out and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't think there's been any notification sent out yet or told or even, you know, ahead of time. Because as licensees, we've been doing three-year renewals for many years now. Electricians are a little bit habitual. We get the paperwork, whether it's online or not. We fill it out. We send it in. We think it's good for three years again. There has to be some better communications with all of it. The participation of the boards, I think as much as we want to find a procedural process that's even, they're not. There's, as Mr. Infantine spoke, you know, they're not all the same. It should be handled the same. And if they did take these and they're trying to find one procedural process, then they didn't repeal these and make them all the same. As you stated, there's got to be some policy changes because not everyone was the same, right? We've heard that already. So there's no way that they took what well, tried to make everything even and kept it what it was and i just think we should look at that a little bit more we had some concerns as far as the privacy like um the definition of allegations complaints and investigations i think is important um i had spoke about a situation i had and i just want to make sure i make that clear it was long before the oplc was even organized so it wasn't anything that happened during this administration or the oplc but you know that a complaint to an allegation, to investigation, somebody calls and files a complaint because they're just mad at me or they haven't been, they're not paying their bill and they want me to go back and finish and now I've got a, a complaint against my, and it's in the file. Things like, what happens if that complaint is found to be, I'm, I'm found not guilty? What happens to that paperwork and that? Does it stay in the OPLC? It really shouldn't if you weren't found guilty. And it was somebody just, you know, having a little bit of, um, payback or something. So who has access to all of this information? If it goes through the investigative bureau, um, I believe Mike was here yesterday, and then maybe there's only certain people who should have access. As I mentioned before, when we were a board by itself, we had one or two administrative people. So at best, maybe two or three people might have access to this information. I don't know the total amount of employees at OPLC, and I don't know the exact structure of it, but I would hope that we would look at that and make sure that we're confining that to as limited amount as people as possible. If there's an investigation department that takes care of the allegations and stuff, then it, every admin in the office doesn't need to have access to all of this information. You know, the they're struggling to get employees. Employees are changing. There's constantly new people in there. So it's just a lot of information that is open to people seeing and going through. Um, on page uh, 12, if you look at, I think it is line 17. Um, it talks about appeals and the appeals to the Supreme Court. One of the things that we had as an electrician's board is we could appeal to the State Building Code Review Board. We did that because, let's face it, if I lose my a decision from the electrician's board, to take it to the Supreme Court is not going to be financially feasible. It gave us an opportunity as blue-collar workers to try to get some sort of appeal and actually there was one that went in front of the board that went to the state building court and was overturned so i would hope that we could look at maybe one other step before the supreme court if there was appeals even if it's a jury of legislators or something like that i think that that's it makes it very difficult while i understand from a legality standpoint it's usually how it works sometimes it's not fair isn't fair if, because you can't afford it is really what it comes down to um also, the um, there was, seems to be two different funds. Just, I believe that's on page five. It speaks about it on the uh, line nine, roughly. It the non-lapsing fund. Yes. And seems to be two of them. And I just wanted some clarification on pay, on line thirty-three. It talks about the ones. Um, I'm sorry. Um, for, for for the there's one for professional licensure. Um, it has to do with on the professional side. There's one for the health side, yes. No, I am 15, I'm sorry. And in paragraph three under that, if you go further down to line 26, at the last line, it says, the monies in this fund shall be continued to appropriate to the office. I just want to get some clarification, whereas the yellow ones show the funds going to back to the um, general fund on the first dedicated fund on line 13. So I was just wondering what the difference was, if they're not 125 or they are, if we're all going to be or not, and how that affects the overall budget and fee structure. So maybe we could. But yeah. I'm sure um, Ms. Courtney could answer that question. Um, also, 
what happens to there's on page eight line six and this is just i'm just trying to give you some examples of that this bill needs a little bit of work we're not necessarily against it we know there has to be some procedure but it talks about that as if you go back to page seven at the bottom it talks about allegations misconduct what they what um they can do and it shows that on line four it says to carry out investigations the executive director is authorized to a retain qualified experts b conduct inspections a place of business and professional regulated under the office all right i'm a small company i have a home in home office i don't really think the oplc should be able to come in and investigate my home i think there should be some guidelines on that whether it's a commercial site or something or whatever but i mean there's a point again we were giving quite a bit of legality to the oplc and when we look at this, Lindsay's not always going to be the director and everybody that in place isn't always going to be there. We've been through this with changes with the Department of Safety when we were under there. So we're trying to look broad, not just right here. We're not, we don't have any issues. She's been very good helping us out working together. But you got to look at this as, are we covering everything so when things change, there's no thing, there's no issue. Um, trying to make sure that the boards don't lose the control they have and i and i i spoke about this to a few people yesterday how do we find some wording that allows them to have the boards have control but to a point where if they're not cooperating that the executive director can move forward i don't know how to word that i'm not a lawyer but i think that would be very helpful because most of the boards that's their concern We're lo they're losing their authority it's all going to the opc like representative ventine stated they're just jurors you know what i mean the content and subject matter of any experts, we would like to clear that up as well so that for boards that have inspectors, that it states that those be, are used first before hiring and everything else because they're licensed, they know what the laws are, the codes are. It's very important that that gets addressed as well. So there's, you know, there's a, the three sections or three different divisions with some, some Close wording would be much better, but I understand that makes it difficult for the executive director as well. Um, balancing the political and administrative part from justice standpoint, as you said, is is very difficult, but I hope the committee will work towards that goal and I'll end at that. Thank you. Your testimony was respectful and I appreciate your concerns. We all do. Anybody else? Yes. My name is Laura Cooley. I'm representing myself. I just want to support that last idea he put forward, that the executive director can intervene when there is a problem. We have no recourse against boards that are not acting properly, who lie in public testimony. There's no recourse. And people are hurt by this. So I would like to support this idea that when a board is not cooperative, somebody else can intervene. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Good morning. My name is Kimberly Kirkland, and I'm a lawyer in Manchester, New Hampshire. And for 15 years, I was a tenured faculty member at the law school here in Concord. And I just wanted to address the issue you raised, Madam Chair, about the balance that's being attempted to be struck with this litigation. Um, I, I think what gets under the various boards skin and the public skin is this idea of procedure and having taught the course in law school that's caused called civil procedure for 15 years it bedevils lawyers as well because although procedure seems like it's just rules about the steps we go through to get something decided it's absolutely integral to doing justice you can't provide justice for the licensed members of all of these boards and for the people making complaints unless there are fair, known, consistently applied procedures. 
and those procedures do affect outcomes. If the procedures are um, all over the place, if they're inconsistently applied, if people don't understand what they are, you're not going to get just outcomes from the system. And so I think this bill is really trying to ensure that the procedures are clear, accessible, and consistently applied. And that will work to the advantage of both the licensees and to the people making complaints. And it will also be beneficial to the OPLC, which has to deal with 55 or 54 different sets of procedural rules, which is a nightmare. Um, so I think it's important from that respect. I also say that although I understand people are saying my my specialty, my substance area is different and requires different procedures. In the legal system, we've been able to create procedures which decide disputes in a vast array of subject areas. So for instance, within civil law, you have the rules of civil procedure and there are state rules and federal rules, but New Hampshire, for instance, has rules of civil procedure that will govern the uh, adjudication of a contract dispute, a construction claim, uh, real estate disputes, um, medical malpractice claims, any kind of sub subject matter you can think of um, will be decided under the same set of procedural rules. So they have to be carefully thought out with all of those different substance substantive areas in mind, but you can create a single set of procedural rules that can cover a wide array of different substantive areas. Um, the other thing that I see this bill doing that I think is really important to the just resolution of the disputes, I'm, I'm focusing on the disciplinary function that these boards serve, is the division of the investigative function, the prosecutorial function, from the adjudicative function. I think you run into problems in terms of bias when the people who are investigating and prosecuting are also adjudicating, and when the people who are investigating and prosecuting are members of the same market as the people who are being investigated or prosecuted. Um, I think we all have a tendency to, you know, want to give the benefit of the doubt to the people within our community and profession. We all know New Hampshire is an incredibly small state. We know each other well. And I'll tell you that the um, lawyers have struggled with this as well. Um, lawyers are not licensed by um, any board from the executive branch. We're licensed by the New Hampshire Supreme Court. But in 2004, uh, the New Hampshire Supreme Court introduced a new system for lawyer discipline because there were perceived problems with having volunteer lawyers who made up the professional conduct committees, which are the equivalent of the, the boards we're talking about here, trying to investigate, prosecute, and adjudicate claims against lawyers. And a decision was made to create an attorney discipline office where there would be a professional investigator and prosecutor who would bring matters to the professional conduct committee made up of a mix of lawyers and lay people um, for adjudication. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's just my perspective. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. I, I was just, I was going to comment. Thank you. Cause I think this is helpful. Very helpful. Yes. Um, in, in the board process in general. Yes. Yeah, so, so when a, a complaint is made, obviously somebody comes in feeling that they've been wronged, but they're, we don't take their word for it. 
and there is some investigation that needs to happen in the civil system you would have a lawyer representing both sides and they would each be given an opportunity to explore what information do you have what information do i have let's exchange that information so we both understand what the world of of uh, facts are that this had to be decided from and that's what the investigator would do here for these boards the investigator from the oplc and it would be that investigator's job to be getting information from both sides and that's a person without a dog in the fight which is a good thing thank you anyone else yes representative shewitt thank you i will just ask um you talked about the civil uh, process having set rules, but I would imagine that there's a separate set of rules for the criminal process, and I think that's part of the point that's being made here. Uh, as Representative Infantine pointed out, there's a vast difference between uh, licensed professionals, construction trades, and medical trades. So I, I think um, that's well, a, a worthy point because they each have different parameters that they have to meet. You're absolutely right. There's a different set of rules of procedure for criminal cases than civil cases. That's because criminal defendants have constitutional rights that are different than civil litigants. Um, however, within the civil justice system, we would decide a complaint between a homeowner and an electrician and between a patient and a doctor. And those would both be decided under the rules of civil procedure. There's a question from the back. Can, can you come, could you come up to this mic here and speak that way we won't misunderstand your question. I would just ask if Ms. Kirkland would outline her vision on who would do the investigation and prosecution. I assume the board would do the adjudication, but how would that be staffed? How would that, what's the procedure? That you know that she doesn't work for OPLC, right? So, I do, but she's made a proposal that there would be a split of those functions, and I, I want to explore that idea. Okay, and apparently Ms. Courtney has something to say, so I'll let her, thank you. And your, I'm sorry, your name again? Brad Holt. Thank you. Thank you, sorry. I just thought I might be in a better position to talk about staffing at the office. Um, so presently we do have um, an enforcement division that has three bureaus. One is with compliance that deals with inspections, which is more of proactive um, compliance, ensuring that people are proactively complying with their um, requirements. And then we have an investigative bureau, which has a chief investigator He's, a, he's an attorney. Um, and then we have our prosecutions bureau that has um, a chief prosecutor who's an attorney. They ha he has um, three prosecutors um, within that bureau. Within the investigations bureau, I think we now have eight authorized investigator positions. We also have many contracts with subject matter experts in the form of consultants, which includes a physician investigator, um, actually two physician investigators, um, as well as a dental consultants um, and nurse consultants. We've, we have other consultants and we are continuously seeking additional consultants. Um, when we do not have the expertise needed, what happens is a board member will recuse themselves um, to provide that subject matter expertise. I envision that it would continue to operate in the same manner, um, except that there would be a, a clearer division of uh, the investigative function from the adjudicative function. Um, I don't anticipate that we would require additional investigators. We do have a, a sufficient investigators at this point, but of course, another part of this bill would give us the ability to um, retain funds to employ additional people as necessary. And to Attorney Holt's point, could you come, let's ask, if, I think you're gonna ask Dr. Uh, Attorney Kirkland for her input, is that what you're? Yeah. 
it is now. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Courtney. I did not have a, a vision different than what Ms. Courtney has just described. I think that's what the proposed bill does, is it separates the investigatory and prosecutorial functions from the adjudicatory function. And would that do away with the function and, I guess, the composition of the medical review subcommittee? Would it do away with that? Yes, I think it would. I, I defer to Ms. Courtney on that, but I think it would. At least as an investigative and prosecutorial unit. And so the medical review subcommittee is composed of physicians, other medical personnel, as well as some lay personnel, but from different disciplines. And so that knowledge base would go away unless the, the uh, staff had that or we recused board members. That's part of the piece I don't understand. I can speak to that, Madam Chair, if you'd like. Yeah, so in the bill, the bill language, and again, this is not an OPLC requested bill, but the bill language does propose eliminating the MRC. Presently, how it works is, well, actually, there have been some recent changes with respect to medical complaints because the Medical Review Subcommittee has had a, a significant issue in the last two years uh, making quorum. Um, in 2021, for example, they only met uh, about half of the time, and it continues to be a, a serious problem, um, which has caused a significant backlog of medical complaints. The way it used to work... Um, prior to the recent changes in the last several months is that literally every complaint, whether it was the physician gave me jello that I didn't like or I was sexually assaulted, had to go through the MRSC. And that creates significant problems when you have a body that's not being met. Also, you don't necessarily need expertise for the complaints that are like, I got the wrong jello, and we do get those. So, um, so previously everything was going through the MRSC. Because that has created a significant backlog, we recently worked with the Board of Medicine to come up with a streamlined process, which does allow staff for initial review of complaints and malpractice filings to determine whether they've met that legal threshold of a, stating a claim. And this is pretty consistent with the civil process. You know, it's, it's pretty routine for defense lawyers to file motions to dismiss saying that the complaint doesn't allege um, a base, a legal basis for the claim. So um, we do have at the moment attorneys and investigators who make that initial assessment. If they determine or they believe that it doesn't state a claim, that is reviewed by our physician investigator. If the physician investigator agrees with that assessment, it goes to the board. If the board disagrees with that assessment, then it goes for formal investigation to the MRC. Um, and if the board agrees with that assessment, it gets dismissed. Now I can tell you what happens at the MRC is that the complaints sit because they're not being investigated. The MRC has explained to us that on average, each person can only review one to two cases max per month. And that's when they meet. And they meet on average about half the time. So if we get four, you know, about 400 complaints a year, which includes malpractice filings, that is why we are not getting through these cases. So I don't know that this is the appropriate model and we're not advocating for, you know, one way or the other. But what I can tell you is that the current model with respect to medical complaints is not working. Um, the bill as proposed would change that. Again, we're not taking a position on whether that's, uh, whether that's the best approach. And I know Representative Pearson has a separate bill on that and we'd be happy to you know, work with him to, um, on different procedures. But I will say that this bill does propose a change. And in my opinion, any change is good at this point because we're just at a standstill when it comes to medical investigations.
Thank you. We will. We'll take that into consideration. Anyone else? Yes. Good morning. My name is Kelly Ledke. I am a master level alcohol and drug counselor. I testified on Wednesday on behalf of myself, but I had a board meeting yesterday. So I just want to update that I've spoken with my board members and they have voted to give me permission to speak on behalf of the alcohol and other drug use professionals board. So that's one update. Um, I'll keep this very brief because I did submit written testimony. I went line by line for each uh, piece that we disagree with and some things that we feel neutral on. Um, I think I just want to again say, when I left on Wednesday, the word streamline was buzzing in my head all day, right? That this was about streamlining, making the process easier. But I think I'm still struggling I guess the buzzword in my head is collaboration. There has to be streamlining, of course, but there has to be collaboration, and I'm not feeling the collaboration in this piece. So what I mean by that is I do think, just as people have testified today, that um, the OPLC has done a wonderful job coming in and making some great changes for us. I still think there's a lot of room to do. I just want you to make a, com make a comment about that. Sure. This is not being driven by OPLC. I understand that. Okay, so they, they didn't make any of the changes. Yep. These are changes that were done by representatives who are on this bill. Right. Okay, good. But the there are going to be changes in the way that we do things with OPLC. So this isn't, this isn't a bash on anybody. This is just saying if we repeal some of these laws, it isn't going to give us the opportunity to do the work that we need to do. And some of them don't feel streamlined, right? Taking away our ability to have an advisory committee is not streamlining anything. Taking away our ability to be able to investigate cases doesn't feel streamlined. It feels like a reduction in our authority as a board. So I just wanna make that point again, that I think everybody can work together. This feels very extreme. Like this, this bill feels like it's over here. We might have been over here, and I want to find us here working together, boards with OPLC to make things better for the public in terms of public safety. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for that comment and explanation. Absolutely. Yes? Okay, is there anyone else who wants to speak? Okay, Dr. Warner. Thank you very much, I do appreciate it. Uh, with the small packet that I gave you, uh, the second page, second piece of paper had amendment language for co concerning cost of investigation. Uh, there's a section uh, in section one, RSA 310 colon 12, sanctions to delete section Roman five. And then also to add a section, perhaps section 192 or reorder, repeals cost of investigations. RSA 332 G colon 11 is repealed. Um, you heard on Wednesday from Dr. Phillips about the cost of investigations being passed along uh, after somebody might be found. Uh, they had a found in complaint, and they're at that point where they're getting sanctions. And uh, just to point out why these are uh, not needed and they're um, overdone is that G11 was passed about um, in 2016, and I did look up, and there were no boards and no providers and no professional associations involved in the development of that legislation. Um, but number one, it's unheard of to collect these costs from the convicted. Even in criminal court cases, the state or local law enforcement does not recover the cost of the investigation from a convicted criminal. Number two, the burden of proof for the license hearing 
is much lower than that even of criminal um, court. In the license hearing, it's clear and convincing evidence, and in the criminal court, it's beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a much higher standard. And yet the licensee would receive a much higher penalty. And now that is an unlimited one. In G11, it was capped at $10,000. And then in this, there's no cap on it at all. Number three, the costs of the investigations are already paid by the licensees as the office has calculated license fees to be 125% of the department operating expenses. They're already been paid, distributed across all licensees, making these redundant monies and unjustified as punitive in nature and therefore an unwarranted violation of the Constitution's Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on this House bill? Nope. Okay. I'm closing the public hearing. I mean the subcommittee meeting. We're going to have another one. So stay tuned. It won't be next week. I can tell you that. Okay? And in the meantime, we will take all these considerations and discuss it um, among ourselves. I have four, five pages of notes here. And... Um, We'll have an amendment. That's why it's going to take a little bit of time. So we'll have an am amendment and see how far we get. How's that? Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for caring about the bill. Have a good day.